today I want to get into talking about MHC function. And all together, both today and Friday, will really be discussions of the process that is shown on this slide in more detail. So we're going to see how our pathogen protein is um, getting into the cell, how it is broken down, how it is uh, put on an MHC molecule and then presented to a T cell. And so we'll go through the steps of this process. In understanding this process, we will have to think a bit about some of the basic cell biology of the biosynthetic secretory pathway or the endocytic pathway. Uh, you may have heard of it with different names. Those are all possible names for it. Um, and so I want to give you a brief refresher on a few things about this, the cell biology of this pathway before we move into antigen presentation. On this slide, you can see a cell with a few different organelles labeled. What you might notice is that the area outside of the cell is yellow. You can see that the cytoplasm is sort of grayish, bluish. I feel like it's usually blue, but this projector is really washing it out. Um, and you can see that the nucleus is this darker color of blue. You can see we have a number of organelles in the cell, like the endoplasmic reticulum, the Golgi, endocytic vesicles, lysosomes, and secretory vesicles. And they are all surrounded by a, a lipid bilayer, a membrane. And they are, in fact, connected to one another by vesicles that transit between those two compartments. So here you can see a vesicle budding off the ER, moving towards the Golgi. Here's a vesicle fusing with the Golgi, moving things around. And we can very broadly think about the cell as having a couple of different parts. One of those parts is the cytoplasm. And one of those parts is the stuff that's across a membrane from the cytoplasm. The stuff that's on the other side of membranes. And in fact, the inside of the ER is across a membrane from the cytoplasm. The inside of the Golgi is across a membrane from the cytoplasm. The inside of one of these vesicles is across the membrane from a cytoplasm, as is the extracellular space. And those compartments are connected by vesicles. So we can broadly think of the cell as being the cytoplasm and the across a membrane parts, the parts that are um, within this pathway, the biosynthetic secretory or endocytic pathway. And they are all labeled in yellow. And so you can see that the cytoplasm is separate from outside of the cell. It's also separate from the insides of these compartments. Um, and these compartments are all connected with one another and are connected with the uh, outside of the cell as well. And the reason why this is really important is that it takes energy to move cargo, especially proteins, across a membrane. The membrane is semi-permeable. Many things are not going to cross it, specifically proteins. And so the cell in all of these cases is going to have to do some specific activity if it wants to move something across a membrane. If it wants a protein outside of the cell, it's got to put that protein through a membrane. If it wants a protein in the ER or in the Golgi or in one of these vesicles, it has to push it across the membrane. And in fact, typically what this cell does is it moves everything across the membrane at the ER and then just sorts it afterwards. And so it does all of that energy-driven movement across the ER membrane and then moves the proteins around further. So all of these um, compartments are connected. You can see that we can move things from the cytosol into a number of different compartments. Often we'll move from the cytosol to the endoplasmic reticulum, and that's sort of the gatekeeper for the rest of this process. Once something goes to the ER, it can go to the Golgi, then it might go to the exterior, it might go to endosomes, it might go to secretory vesicles. It can go through a whole lot of places in the vesicular transport pathway. 
And so today we're going to be thinking a lot about is something in the vesicular transport pathway or is it not in the vesicular transport pathway? Um, is it in the yellow that you saw on the previous slide or is it in the blue? Um, you can see that same process in picture form here. Um, when proteins are made in the cell, uh, they can be made on free ribosomes and be made as free cytostolic proteins. Alternatively, those ribosomes can bind to the ER to form part of the rough ER. And the protein can be synthesized directly across the membrane. In fact, the cell uses the same energy that it was using to make the proteins to also impart a mechanical force and shove it across the membrane. <laughs> um, and so the proteins get made either as cytoplasmic or is as in the vesicular transport pathway. And it's a major way that we can kind of sort the different parts of the cell. And once a protein is in the vesicular transport pathway, it can go through the Golgi, it can go to the plasma membrane, it can go to the lysosome. It can go anywhere within this vesicular transport pathway. There's also an important piece of this to think about that is topology. And in some ways you look at this and it feels completely obvious. And then we actually try to apply this later and you're like, wait, what? Who? So I want to just make it really clear. Um, here you can see some different compartments. These compartments could be the ER and the Golgi, or they could be the Golgi and a secretory vesicle, or the Golgi and, well, we'll get to the outside of the cell in a second. But it could be any two compartments. Here it's just compartment beginning, compartment end, or compartment beginning, compartment end. <laughs> and the way that this process of moving things through the vesicular transport pathway works is that you will have your original donor compartment sort of make this bud of a vesicle with some cargo, some contents in it. That vesicle will be surrounded by cargo and will travel through the cell and eventually fuse with a donor compartment. And you can see that in both places here. What I want you to notice is that in both of these figures, the two layers of the lipid bilayer are colored differently. You can see that in this figure, the blue part of the lipid bilayer is touching the cytoplasm and the green part is away from the cytoplasm. And throughout this entire process, the part that's touching the cytoplasm always stays touching the cytoplasm and the part that's away from the cytoplasm always stays away from the cytoplasm. So you can see the budding process happen you can see that the cargo at the beginning was away from the cytoplasm inside. The cargo stays inside, away from the cytoplasm. The green lipids stay on the inside. The blue stays on the outside. And when we fuse, the green lipids fuse back with the inner compartment. Uh, the blue is with the outer compartment. The cargo goes back in. So once you're away from the cytoplasm, you are always away from the cytoplasm. <laughs> um, and so you can see that process happening in both of these figures with the membrane always staying in the same orientation. The reason why that matters, um, or one of the reasons why that matters, has to do with protein orientation. If you look at this figure on the left, you can see that the protein is drawn um, asymmetrically. The protein on the right is drawn asymmetrically as well. It's just less easy to see because it's a square and a circle that aren't easy to tell apart. The other one is a circle and like a more straight part. What you will notice is at the top, the circle part of the protein is touching the cytoplasm. And the straight part is away from the cytoplasm. And as that protein traffics throughout our vesicles and throughout the things, the straight part, the part that's away from the cytoplasm that's in the vesicle always stays away from the cytoplasm in the vesicle. And the circle-y part that's touching the cytoplasm always stays touching the cytoplasm. So when we insert proteins into a membrane, the orientation is very important because we don't get to flip them over. It matters which orientation we have that protein uh, inserted in the membrane. So that as we, because as we move that protein around, it's going to remain in that orientation. This becomes particularly important at the cell membrane. So if we have cargo moving to the cell membrane, um, it is going to go through the Golgi and is going to 
uh, potentially be secreted. What you'll see is that the cargo that's on the inside, that's away from the cytoplasm, the blue line cargo, once this vesicle fuses with the cell membrane, gets secreted it, it, away from the cytoplasm here, because it's inside the vesicle, and it's away from the cytoplasm here. It's secreted from the cell. So anything that wants to be secreted from the cell has to be in one of these vesicles. It's got to get into this transport pathway, and it's got to get into that transport pathway in the right side, in the right uh, orientation. Also importantly, you can look at these proteins that are transmembrane proteins. You can see that this transmembrane protein has the knobby part outside the cell and the straight part inside the cell. To make that work, when that protein was in the vesicle, the knobby part had to be in the middle of the vesicle and the straight part had to be outside. And when that protein was in the ER, the knobby part had to be towards the middle of the ER and the straight part had to be outside. And so it actually matters how that protein goes into the ER, how that protein goes into the membrane in the first place, if you want it to be in the right direction at the end. And so you could imagine, this is gonna be really important for us with MHC, if we wanna present the peptide at the surface of our cell, that MHC kinda has to be pointing in the right direction. If you put the MHC in the membrane in the opposite direction, it's not gonna stimulate anything, it's gonna be going the wrong way. And so the orientation of how the MHC is in the membrane is going to be quite critical here. If we have some vesicle that fuses with the plasma membrane, it can release its cargo and that process can be called exocytosis or secretion. If we have cargo outside and the cell makes a vesicle around it, we can have that cargo inside of a vesicle. It's the same topology again. That process is endocytosis, um, at least for right now. We'll talk a little bit about phagocytosis later. So these are just some general cell biology things that are going to make our lives easier as we think about MHC presentation. So first, we're going to talk specifically about the MHC presentation pathway for MHC class 1. Here is our MHC class 1 structure that we saw last time. Remember that MHC class 1 has a heavy chain as well as this light chain, beta-2M, which is non-covalently attached. Um, I didn't mention this explicitly last time, but in fact, the heavy chain plus beta-2M um, does not fold correctly until there is also a peptide there. So the only way you really get correct folding of all these proteins is when they are together with peptide. Um, MHC class 1, of course, also binds to CD8 which is why MHC class 1 presents its antigen to CD8 positive T cells. And this process of MHC class 1 presentation that we're going to see occurs on all nucleated cells in your body. So all of this is pretty, pretty much the same as stuff we saw last time. We also saw last time this idea that MHC class 1 is specifically presenting peptides from the cytoplasm. And so now you can start to see why this is important because I told you about this, the cell having the two compartments, the cytoplasm and the not cytoplasm. Um, and so here we're going to see that distinction as well. Class 1 is really for peptides that are in that not cytoplasm compartment. When I was originally kind of taught MHC and really uh, started thinking about it, I learned to divide MHC presentation pathways the processing parts of it that we're talking about today and on Friday, into six steps. I'm going to tell you these, each of these six steps for class one today, for class two on Friday is the general plan. And as you look at these steps, some of them you may say, that's a really dumb thing to give its own step. Like, why are you like making such a big deal about this little thing? Why does it get its own step? And usually the answer is because it's a big place of compare and contrast between class one and class two. So as you see these six steps today, some of them are going to clearly be important and clearly be things that should be like focused on as a step. And others are going to look kind of silly. And the reason for that is because something important is going to happen there for class two, which we'll see next time. So um, I understand if some of this feels weird now, it will make more sense when we get the other steps together. So our steps are acquisition. So how, do, does, how does the cell first acquire the antigen? How do we tag 
um, the antigen for destruction, so tagging for destruction. How do we proteolize the antigen? So how does proteolysis occur? How does delivery of antigen and MHC to the same place occur? How does binding of the antigen to the MHC occur? And then how does display happen? So these are the six steps that we are going to see for both class one and for class two. We talked a little bit last time about class one and the fact that it is a place for presentation of cytosolic peptides. And I asked you to hypothesize a way that cytosolic peptides could be generated. I asked you to say, what pathogen could you imagine being a pathogen resulting in cytoplasmic antigen, cytoplasmic peptides? And what pathogen was that? I hear whispers. Virus. So Alina says it's a virus. And yes, in fact, a virus is most commonly the type of pathogen we think about with class one, though many pathogens can be presented on class one. So how does a cell acquire a viral protein? What do you think, Marina? I read your lips, sorry. <laughs> it gets infected. Does a cell have to really do anything here? Is it an active process? Not exactly, it's pretty passive. The cell isn't kind of like saying, I would like to acquire antigen today. The cell just is unlucky. It gets infected. And so in the case of class one, acquisition's really easy. It's a pretty passive process. It's simply getting infected with the pathogen such that the proteins will now be present in the cell's cytosol. And so in the case of class one, Acquisition is simply infection. Nothing too fancy going on there. Things get a little more fancy when we get to the next step, or tagging for destruction. Um, the tagging for destruction and the proteolysis are closely linked. So I have a couple of the slides labeled proteolysis part one and proteolysis part two. Um, proteolysis part one is tagging. Um, so, in fact, in all of your cells, your proteins have a half-life. Some proteins get uh, made incorrectly, and are mis some proteins are misfolded. Some proteins get damaged by presence in the cell, and some proteins just turnover. There's a general rate of turnover in cells. Um, sometimes I jokingly refer to this as being sort of like an iPhone. Sometimes you don't really need a new one, but you get rid of the one you have and make a new one. And you can kind of imagine that in this, for the cell as being sort of a risk management strategy. You don't know if you're, how many of your proteins are getting damaged, and so you can just get rid of the old ones that potentially have been damaged and make some new ones at some kind of rate. So your cell has general ways that it gets rid of proteins. Um, and the class one pathway uses one of these general ways of getting rid of proteins for tagging and for proteolysis. The tagging is a process called ubiquitination. There are also people who, re who refer to this process as ubiquitilation. So if you hear that, they're actually the same thing. People say it differently. Um, so the idea is that our protein from our pathogen, which is shown here as this green scribble, um, can have this thing called a ubiquitin added to it. Um, the ubiquitin is going to be added by some specific enzymes, the ubiquitin conjugating enzymes, and that is going to tag this protein for destruction. Ubiquitin is, in fact, a protein itself. It is an 8.5 kilodalton protein with 76 amino acids. And so this is a uh, ribbon diagram of ubiquitin. 
There are a couple of lysines in ubiquitin, lysine 63, lysine 48, that are pretty frequently used to add ubiquitin to things. And so sometimes people talk about, well, does this, is this a, a K48 linkage or a K63 linkage um, based on which lysine um, uh, ubiquitin is attached to? So ubiquitin can get attached to things and lead those things potentially to destruction. Just as a general cell biological thing, typically for a protein to be destroyed, it needs to have four ubiquitins added in a specific biochemical linkage. If ubiquitins are added to proteins either in different numbers or with a different orientation, so if you had like four by themselves instead of four in a line, or if you had a different type of biochemical linkage, that can signal other outcomes in the cell. So in fact, some signal transduction pathways involve ubiquitin just with different kinds of addition structures. So for uh, tagging for destruction, we have four ubiquitins added to um, our target protein in a chain that looks something like this. And so ubiquitination of our protein um, is the way that that protein is tagged for destruction. We add this ubiquitin just like we're adding a little tag that says get rid of this. Um, and in fact, ubiquitin was uh, a protein that people were originally studying. They were trying to figure out its function. They were looking at cells it was present in, and they found that it was kind of everywhere. It was ubiquitous, so they called it ubiquitin. <laughs> Um, once a protein has been labeled with ubiquitin, it can be proteolized by uh, a particular proteolytic pathway in the cell, and that pathway is known as the proteasome. You can see the proteasome here. I'm going to talk a little bit about the proteasome's structure. So the proteasome is an organelle. One of the ways you might know that the proteasome is an organelle is it has ohm at the end. If you had to guess from the name proteasome what this organelle did, or dud, did, or does, <laughs> what might you guess? Yes, Molly. Molly thinks it does proteolysis. And in fact, that's true, because this is the protease ohm. It's the organelle of proteases, the protease ohm, or the proteasome. Um, and you can look at the word. It's protease ohm, just with the E and taken out of the middle. Um, this is basically a container where there are a number of active protease sites that are hidden from the rest of the cell so we don't destroy the whole cell, but where we can put proteins to degrade them. You can see that there's a cap on either side that's going to be really important for regulation. And you can see that there are these rings made up of individual proteins. There are actually four rings made of seven proteins each, um, making sort of the cylinder of the proteasome. And at the beginning, we have full proteins that are labeled by ubiquitin. At the end, we have peptides that are coming out. And you can kind of think of this as you know, the trash compactor or something like that for the cell. So this is what the proteasome looks like in cross-section. You can see that the cap is actually relatively large in structure. Um, these are rings, the four rings with seven subunits each, are the core. And if you cut through, you can see that there are basically areas inside of that core where the protease activity is centered. So these all have protease activity, and the active sites of their proteases are in the middle of this cylinder. So things that get put into that cylinder are going to get cut up by the protease activity of those rings. The basic way that this works is that the cap will bind to our target protein with ubiquitin. So the cap has a ubiquitin binding site. And then the cap starts to unfold the protein and thread it into the active site part of the proteasome. And you can see that here. So you can see the uh, the ubiquitins being bound to the cap, the protein starting to be uh, threaded into 
the active site part of the proteasome to be degraded into peptides. Um, you can also notice that the ubiquitin is released to be recycled to add onto some other protein. Um, and we end up with our peptides coming out the other end of the proteasome. Uh, one of the versions of this in your textbook shows that these peptides can vary quite a bit in length, very much in length. Um, they also can vary, um, they can even get down to being almost single amino acids. Usually a tumor, a two amino acids is the smallest it can do, but there can be times where you see single amino acids. So if we're thinking about class one presentation and we have this huge array of different sized peptides being made, do you think that that's the most useful thing for MHC binding? Or what might be more useful? Clearly people are shaking their heads, no, it's not useful. So what would be more useful? What would you like if you could design, if you were in charge of the world and you could design what peptides came out of the proteasome, what would you want to come out of the proteasome? Yeah, Jordan. You'd want peptides that are between eight and 10 amino acids long because the class one molecule binds peptides that are eight to 10 amino acids long. That would be ideal. Um, and you also might want some other features of peptides that we haven't really gotten into at this point. It turns out that this is sort of the standard proteasome. This is what all your cells have right now that are just getting rid of proteins, um, whether they're older defective proteins, whether they're pathogen proteins, whatever. If you start to make an immune response, you will have cytokines being produced. Cytokines will change transcription and translation in your cells. One of the new products that will be made when these cytokines start to act will be new subunits for the proteasome. So there are subunits of the proteasome that can swap out. We can get rid of some of the sort of normal sub, uh, constituents of the proteasome and put in new constituents of the proteasome. Um, these are controlled by cytokines, specifically they're controlled by interferon production. So when there's interferon around, we get the substitute members of the proteasome. And now the proteasome becomes something known as the immunoproteasome. And it starts making peptides that are even more ideal for class one. So once we've started making a response, the cells adapt by trying to make more ideal peptides. So there are certainly gonna be some peptides that are made by the normal proteasome and the immunoproteasome. There are gonna be some peptides that are made specifically by the immunoproteasome. There are some peptides that are only made by the normal proteasome. So we're going to see a little bit of a shift in which peptides are made. So this is how we're going to get some peptides for the MHC. Um, so our, we're gonna see some proteolysis with the proteasome. The place where things get really interesting with class one is at the next step. So I have a few things I wanna point out on this slide. First of all, you can see in light blue, our MHC class one molecule and beta two microglobulin. These proteins are eventually going to be on the surface of the cell presenting the peptides out to a T cell. As a result, they need to have this sort of topology in the ER membrane. The MHC molecule has to have its transmembrane domain through the ER membrane and its peptide binding cleft inside the ER, in the ER lumen. And that's the way we're going to get this actually pointing out of the cell by the end. One thing that I mentioned to you before is that MHC class one doesn't really fold correctly until it also has beta two microglobulin and a peptide. So before we have a peptide, in theory, we're not gonna have proper folding. Fortunately, there are a number of chaperones in the ER that can hold MHC class one and beta two M together into the right structure um, to sort of get them ready. 
So MHC class 1 is biosynthesized into the ER on rough ER ribosomes, the way membrane proteins are made. Um, and it's bound by a number of different uh, chaperones so that it's held ready to go in the ER, ready to find its peptides. But we can also notice a different problem in this image. Here is our proteasome. Our proteasome has proteolized peptides to make those peptides. This is happening in the cytoplasm because these are cytoplasmic antigens. The proteasome is actually the garbage can for the cytoplasm. We're going to have a different garbage can for the secretory pathway, but that's Friday. Um, so we got our peptides here. We have our MHC here um, with an open cleft ready to go for the peptides. But there's a huge problem. What's the huge problem that you could see here? It's a huge problem. Yeah, Emilio. The peptides are in the cytosol. Why is that a problem? Because it's not the correct conformation for it to get to the MHC receptor, which needs to be facing the inside of yeah. the lumen. The peptides are in one place and the MHC is in another place. How the heck is this peptide going to bind to this open cleft when they're in two different places? Not only that, they're not just in two different places. They're not in HS105 and HS106. They're on two different sides of the membrane of, a, of a, this ER membrane. And it takes a lot of energy to move stuff across the ER membrane. The ER membrane is not just randomly permeable. This is a big problem. And so this is this problem of delivery, of how the heck do we deliver these peptides to this MHC molecule, is really the problem for MHC class 1. Um, there were a number of scientists who were studying some cells that were missing MHC class 1, I guess in like the 70s. I don't know, before I started doing immunology. I can't tell you exactly what year it was. Um, and uh, they were just trying to figure out why the cells didn't do class 1. They actually kind of, uh, I, my PhD advisor said, you know, I studied those cells at the time, but it didn't occur to me that they were going to have a mutation in like an important MHC protein. I just thought, a lot of people I think overthought it and didn't realize what, the, what kind of cells they had sitting in their hands. <laughs> but eventually someone actually looked at this particular cell one that everyone studied, and they found out that it had a mutation in one of two uh, genes encoding one of two proteins. These proteins are known as TAP1 and TAP2, the transporter for antigen processing, number one and number two. These two proteins come together to make an ATP-dependent pump that pumps proteins across the ER membrane. So we're going to use energy, we're going to use ATPs to actually push peptides into the ER once they've been made in the cytoplasm. And so the discovery of TAP was really the key part of this whole process. And so TAP is key, and TAP is the protein that is important for delivery. Once we get to past delivery, Things are relatively straightforward for MHC class 1. The next step that needs to happen is binding. We're going to need to bind that MHC class 1 uh, protein with peptide. Binding is relatively straightforward. Happily, the chaperones I mentioned to you before, one special chaperone known as tapicin that's shown here in pink, shown up there in pink. Tapicin is not only a chaperone that helps to hold MHC class 1 in its proper uh, structure, it also holds MHC class 1 directly next to TAP. So that as soon as the peptides are shot into the ER, they can go right in, they can fall right into the MHC. And so tapicin is pretty important for this uh, binding process because it allows close proximity between the open MHC molecule with its open cleft and the incoming peptides from 
Um, we also might have things like the peptide can even be trimmed by proteases to make it exactly the right length and fit perfectly. Um, ERAP that's shown here is one of those trimming proteins. So we can see the uh, peptide binding pretty well. And as long as that peptide has appropriate anchor residues, it just binds. Simple. It just, if it's got the right anchor residues, it binds. Nothing fancy has to happen. Um, and then in, once this part of the process has happened, we're able to get to display. And so the uh, interesting events here are with class one. We've got to deliver our peptide onto class one. But once that has happened, basically this MHC plus peptide uh, molecule is able to simply travel through the biosynthetic secretory pathway the way any old thing travels through the biosynthetic secretory pathway. It actually takes no additional signals, no additional effort. This is the way the biosynthetic secretory pathway just works. Um, you may have heard of something being called constitutive. That means constitutive is sort of, is, means basically automatic. Um, sort of the thing that happens if nothing, else, if nothing pushes yet to happen. Um, this is the constitutive biosynthetic secretory. So once we actually have binding, display is entirely constitutive. Um, once this process has happened, this antigen can be presented to a T cell, specifically a CD8 positive T cell, which will be um, able to kill the infected cell. So this is going to lead to T cell killing. In the paper that you're going to read for next week, sometimes the assays that you're going to see are measuring CD8 T cell activity. But really, the idea is that the authors are trying to see whether the peptide bound to the MHC, and thus whether you could get the CTL activity at the end. So you are going to see some assays where they try to bind peptide to MHC. You will also see assays where they try to look at killing. So they'll mix cells together, effector cells, or the killers, and target cells, and look for killing. And they will also measure a cytokine interferon gamma, which is frequently made by uh, T cells. So when you see interferon gamma, or when you see um, effector target cells and killing, um, both of those are just telling you that T cells work, which means the peptide had to have bound to the MHC. So that's what's going on with that paper. Um, so there are a few details about class one that we also need to talk about. So let's imagine for a second that we can think of the HIV gag protein. It's a whole big protein. Someone who, if someone really wants to, who has their computer up, they can Google for us how many amino acids there's in HIV gag, because I don't remember off the top of my head. But even without that piece of knowledge, before we learn that crucial thing, how many peptides that are 8 to 10 amino acids long do you think can be made from that one antigen of that one virus? Yes, Cal. A lot. <laughs> A lot would be the correct answer. <laughs> um, some of them are going to have the wrong anchor residues and not bind to your personal MHC type. But many of them probably will. And so even for one antigen from one pathogen, do you have something, Marina? All right, so it's a 499 amino acid protein. So if you think about di different 8 to 10 amino acid proteins that can be made out of that, we, we get quite a lot, as Cal correctly points out. Um, some of them are going to bind your MHC because they have the right anchor residue. Some aren't. But there's probably, even in you, multiple peptides that can be presented on your class 1 simply from this one antigen, multiple epitopes from this antigen that can be presented. One thing that we do note is that there is a phenomenon known as immunodominance that occurs. And so all of those peptides um, are not always presented at the same rate. 
and they do not all uh, induce the same number of T cells. Some of it has to do with uh, protein abundance and things like that. Um, other things have to do with actually the way that the T cell is activated. Um, and so there's a lot about this process that we don't understand. Um, but we do know that there tend to be dominant epitopes for any particular uh, antigen. And in the paper that you're going to see, they will be measuring the dominant epitopes of HIV in some of their patients. And in some cases, they will look at the subdominant epitopes, the epitope that isn't the winner, but perhaps does some job. And maybe if the dominant one is missing, the subdominant's all you got. Um, it's probably going to make less effective T cells than the dominant one will make. Um, and that has a lot to do with things like strength of binding to T cell receptors, things like that. So that's what this immunodominance process is. The next slide is one of the most important things you can know about MHC class 1 in terms of us moving forward. And I'm going to tell, tell you, and it's going to make sense, but then I'm going to give you some like crazy examples. And hopefully, you will remember this fact by the end of those crazy examples as well, which is that self-peptides are always being presented on your cells. So all of your cells that have a nucleus have MHC on their surface right now. And they are all presenting self-peptides. So if you have no infection, you are completely healthy, all of your cells are still presenting self-peptides on MHC class 1. And if you think about it, this makes sense for a few reasons. One reason is because, you know, when peptides come out of the proteasome, you don't know if they're a good peptide or a bad peptide. They're just 8 to 10 amino acids of stuff. You don't know where it came from. You can't necessarily say, this is a bad protein, this is a good protein. There are just peptides come out of the proteasome. Some of them are from your normal proteins that are being degraded. That's why I mentioned the fact that all proteins have some normal half-life. They're just getting shot out of the proteasome, and they're going to go through this process. There isn't like a sorting for good versus bad. I will tell you that there are a few people who have crazy hypotheses, or not crazy hypotheses, but hypo detailed hypotheses about how that works and ways that there could be a little bit of selection, but don't worry about that for now. Um, so every cell even an infected cell is probably going to have some MHCs that are presenting peptides from pathogens, like this LCMV peptide shown on both of these cells, but also self-peptides are going to be presented all the time as well. So all of your cells all of the time are presenting self-peptides. So if nothing else that uh, you learn this semester, realize that not only when you, next time your mom yells at you, can you say, Mom, I'm doing VDJ. I'm not doing nothing. You can also say, Mom, I'm doing class 1 MHC presentation. I'm not doing nothing, because you are doing that. Yes, Marina. How does uh, one distinguish um, self-peptide from So Marina wants to know, OK, how do we distinguish the self-peptide from the pathogen peptide? Why do you worry about that, Marina? So, so presentation of self-peptides could be something that could lead to autoimmune reactions, right? That could be a pretty easy way autoimmune reactions can happen. This is why the selection parts and the, of the T cells are going to be really important. Because in fact, remember how I told you with B cells that we hang out right on the edge of autoimmunity all the time? This is another way. We don't want to have you know, some kind of selection for like the bad peptide versus the good peptide, because you could imagine that viruses could figure out ways to evade that pretty well. So all peptides go on the cell surface. That's why when we talked about MHC and I told you that Dr. Miller likes to talk about it as a trophy, a look what I caught, I usually talk about it instead as a flagpole, because it's not just things you caught, it's also just things you have as a normal cell. And the cell is presenting its normal self-peptides kind of to show it's healthy. Kind of as a show of, look, I have some proteins, things are OK. But you're absolutely right. This is another place where you can easily see if anything goes a little bit wrong, autoimmunity and self-reactivity can happen. And this is going to be an important thing in uh, autoimmunity 
And really the way we enforce this is because of the way that T cells get selected, um, which we will see coming up later. But that's a fabulous question. That was actually specifically where I was going, so good job reading my mind. So this is our MHC uh, presentation pathway in summary. I also want to tell you about some other things that can happen with this process. If you were to look at this pathway as a U, does this seem like a good thing or a bad thing to you? Do you like MAC class one presentation or not? Is it helping you? Yeah, we like this. This is helping us. Good times. Now if you look at this pathway as a virus, how do you feel about this pathway? Not good. This is like your enemy. <laughs> this is going to really kind of have you shown off. You can't hide inside the cell. You can't hide some divergent protein inside your cell. Every single protein in, or in your, your virus, every single protein in your pathogen is getting degraded. It's getting presented. It's inside the cell. It's all getting shown off. You, you kind of have nothing to hide at this point as a virus. And so, in fact, there has been exceptionally strong selective pressure for viruses to come up with ways to mess with this pathway. And many different viruses have evolved ways to mess with this pathway. There are a number of these that we are going to talk about. So this is sort of a general way that viruses can inhibit immune responses in total. And you can see that they happen. We can have viral um, inhibition of antibodies. We can have viral inhibition of inflammatory responses. But one of the really big famous ones is viral inhibition of MHC class 1. And in fact, sometimes by looking at what parts of the cell does a virus mess with, uh, we are able to find really important immune proteins. Because we know that if a virus has actually gone to enough work to evolve around a protein, that protein must do something important. Um, and so many of our important immune proteins have been found in this manner. Uh, in fact, one of the proteins I told you about today was found in this manner. All of the viruses that I am going to give you as examples today are, I'm looking because I might have two things about them. Yeah, they're actually both true. Um, are going to be large DNA viruses. The reason why this matters is that viruses that are large, which are, usually goes along with being a DNA virus, um, tends to have a lot of extra genome space where they can have bells and whistles. They can have extra proteins that do all sorts of fun things. Tiny viruses don't really have too much genome space to do fun things. Um, HIV is a rather tiny virus. And the paper we're going to read next week, you're going to see HIV's evasion strategy, which is different than the evasion strategies you see here, because it's a small virus. These are things that large viruses are able to do, because they can actually encode whole proteins to mess with stuff. Every single step that I have told you about here has been identified in some way to be evaded by some virus um, of the class one presentation pathway. So one of the one that's quite famous is a virus known as Epstein-Barr virus. This is the causative agent of mono, um, as well as a lymphoma type called Burkitt's lymphoma. And Epstein-Barr virus uh, has a protein known as EBNA1. EBNA1 has this, these stretches of glycines and alanines, which you can see here. And what was learned in studying EBNA1, so it turns out that glycine and alanine, um, also EBNA1 is the protein that is made at the highest level in EBV. So when a cell is infected by this virus, the protein that gets made the most is EBNA1. So you could imagine EBNA1 would be the thing that would be in all the MHCs. There would be tons of it degraded, tons of it in the MHCs. Um, EBNA1 has all these glycines and alanines. Turns out glycine and alanine seem to clog the proteasome. Um, and so this basically gums up the proteasome. <laughs> and this protein cannot be degraded well by the proteasome. And as a result, this peptide, even though this protein is super, super um, high level in the cell, there's almost none of this peptide presented, or no peptides from this protein presented. 
Um, and so Epstein-Barr is able to avoid this by, oh, sorry, they don't avoid acquisition. They avoid uh, proteolysis and tagging. There really are no viruses that evade acquisition because that would be evading infection and that would be kind of missing the point of being a virus. So we really don't have evasion there. But we've got this protein that is going to evade. Um, this protein is not going to get degraded very well in the proteasome. Um, however, some other proteins may still be degraded in the proteasome in this situation. When this happens, do you think that this infected cell will present self-peptide? I see mixed head shakes. We're going to present self-peptides here. So, Alina, you say no. Why do you say no? It's not totally, cl it, it's clogged in that it can't degrade this protein, but other proteins can get degraded. So is our self-peptides going to be presented? Yes. Everything else can get degraded and presented. The MHC is going to make it to the surface of the cell with self-peptides. It's just not going to have EBNO1. So this virus is going to remain undetected. The next two are probably the two most famous of these viral evasion proteins. And in fact, they were used to discover TAP. Um, these proteins, one is from cytomegalovirus, uh, US6. The other is from herpes simplex virus, uh, ICP-47. Both of these are large DNA viruses. They're both types of herpes viruses. And they're both doing this process by the same function. I, this figure makes me super sad because the actual structure of these proteins is really cool and they're drawn here as blobs. And I wish they were drawn as their actual structure. Um, but what they both do is they get in the way of TAP. And so they just stop things going through TAP. Um, and their structure looks like a stopper. It just looks like you jammed a stopper into TAP. Um, in the case of ICP-47, it's on the cytoplasm side. In the case of US6, it's on the ER side, and there's a transmembrane domain. But either, case, either way, they both block TAP, basically like a stopper. And, you can, and so these guys inhibit delivery. In this case, do you think that there are self-peptides presented? What do you think, Molly? No. Molly thinks, Molly tiredly thinks no. Um, so we're not going to be able to get any peptides into the ER. We're not going to get any peptides making it to MHC. MHC is going to just sit there open, ready to catch a peptide. It's never going to get any peptides. And as a result, that MHC is going to be held in the ER. It's never going to leave the ER. And so these cells are going to end up with no MHC on their surface. The MHC is not going to get to go through the rest of the steps because the MHC is uh, going to um, be messed up. There are a few cases where you will get some empty MHC on the surface, but you get very little MHC, and anything that you get is empty. Um, there's another protein, uh, adenovirus E19. E19 gets in between tapicin and the MHC molecule and shoves them apart. So the MHC molecule can't be folded correctly and also can't have uh, peptides bound to it. So it basically disrupts this complex of tapicin and TAP and the MHC molecule. And so the adenovirus can inhibit binding using this protein. One particularly sneaky protein is made by murine gamma herpes virus. Um, this one binds to the MHC molecule. So you can see the protein MK3 binding to this, the uh, transmembrane domain and the cytoplasmic tail of the MHC molecule and puts a bunch of ubiquitins on it so it gets pulled out of the membrane and degraded. It just throws the MHC away. 
So in this case, or in the adenovirus case, do you think that there is MHC on the surface of these cells? What do you think, Manny? No. So again, here the virus is avoiding MHC presentation by just pulling MHC completely off of the cell. And this is just a small set of examples of other types of evasion strategies. Basically, if you can think of a step of this process, there's a virus that has been shown to evade it. Um, so we've got EBNA1 clogging up the proteasome. We've got inhibition of TAP on either side. We have inhibition at tapicin. Um, there are some proteins that pull uh, MHC out of the membrane and ubiquitin it, ubiquitinally it, send it to the proteasome. There are some that actually pull it out of the Golgi and, set, and send it to de degradation of the lysosome. There are some that pull it off the cell membrane <laughs> and send it to degradation of the lysosome. So basically every single step here can be degraded. And in all of these cases, or all but the EBNA1 case, this, the resulting cell has no MHC on its surface. Not only does it have no pathogen MHC on its surface, it doesn't have presentation of self MHC on its surface. And so we have evolved a mechanism that detects cells that are missing MHC. This is so common. You have a cell right now whose job it is to look for cells who are missing MHC. And the assumption is those cells are infected or those cells have a serious problem. Um, and so if a cell is missing MHC, it gets killed by your natural killer cells, your NK cells. That's the point of NK cells. Um, and so A, remembering that self-peptides are always presented is really, really, really important. Because if you didn't remember that, if self-peptides don't get presented for some reason, you're going to kill that cell with NK cells. Um, but it also gives us some questions to think about with autoimmunity. Um, you can see that this has been such a strong viral selective pressure that viruses have tried to evade MHC class 1. And it's become such a good selective pressure that we've evolved a way around the viruses evolving a way around it. <laughs> um, so it, this has been a major place where we see um, co-evolution of host and virus.